thanks to the organizers for putting all this together. I know it's a lot of work. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I've read papers by many, many people in the room. And it's really nice to get to meet people and put faces to names and, and have conversations about these things, too. Uh, this is work going on at the University of Rochester in a collaboration between engineers and neuroscientists that so far has been really stimulating for me. And I want to right away acknowledge uh, Jeff Tinoff, who's uh, uh, an engineer transitioning from postdoc to faculty. Whenever I say we did some data analysis, that means Jeff did the data analysis. I also want to acknowledge American Mester, a PhD student in neuroscience. Whenever I said, say we did some experiments, it means Umberto did the experiments. So we're thinking about CSF dynamics and flow of cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, it circulates widely through the skull and central nervous system, as we've seen in multiple presentations today. And uh, as it does so, it can sweep other substances along with it. So, oh yeah, contrast, here's, here's the better neighborhood. Um, if you inject dye into the cesarean magna of a live mouse, you'll see something like this. You can see the dye getting swept along by the flow of cerebral spinal fluid. If you inject radio labeled tracer into the brain of a rat and measure its progress with MRI, you can see something like this. And I'm repeating some data we've already seen today because it's really nice and also demonstrates that if you inject radio label tracer into the brain of a human. You can see it get swept along. And uh, in all these cases, the tracer is coming from you know, somewhere outside the deep brain tissue. Uh, we see it. it, seems like it's entering into deep brain tissue, and for sure it gets clear eventually. So there's this interesting dynamics of cerebral spinal fluid flowing. And uh, it would carry along not just dyes that we add in the lab because we want to see it, but also other things that might be dissolved or suspended in the fluid, including, for example, of course, the proteins that correlate with neurodegenerative disorders, which is good reason to be having this meeting. Uh, I hope we might do something about that. So this is really interesting to me as an engineer to think about the system and how it works. And you might divide it into three parts. There's uh, the outflow of the efflux. And oh, we were talking about that some at lunch. Probably uh, nerve sheets play a big role. Maybe lymph vessels. It's a big open question. I will have nothing to contribute to that conversation today because I don't have any new data on that. But it's interesting. Um, that's one, outflow. You can talk about uh, how this fluid and whatever it's carrying move through brain tissue. Also really interesting. Uh, a key question for sure is what's the relative importance of advection and diffusion there? Uh, I have nothing new to say about that today either because I have no new data about that. Although one musing, you know, if I were designing uh, a waste removal system, I designed it to look a lot like the vascular system where infection dominates at large scales where it works best and diffusion dominates at small scales where it works best. We'll see. Great topic for future study. Uh, today I'm going to talk about influx. I'm going to talk about the paths that take fluid in, uh, the perivascular spaces. You, know, you, you can see already in this video that this dye was being carried in preferentially uh, along the perivascular spaces that, of course, uh, surround the arteries. And that's what I'm talking about, because that's what we've been studying, because that's what we can see. <coughs> so we've been imaging perivascular spaces with <coughs> two-photon microscopy. We remove a patch of skull from a live mouse, install a cranial window, and gain direct access to surface arteries under perivascular spaces, middle cerebral artery, and uh, other surface arteries further downstream. We inject one micron fluorescent tracer spheres so that we can see the motion of the cerebral spinal fluid. We uh, inject into the cerebral magnet. And then we image. And when we image, we see things like this. Here's the middle cerebral artery in red. Uh, the perivascular space is 
this black region surrounding it, and the green dots are the one micron fluorescent microspheres that are being swept along as CSF floats. The rainbow colored tails we're drawing on in post processing, more about that in a minute. So, uh, from this video, you can see that cerebral spinal fluid flows smoothly through 40 micron perivascular spaces in the same direction as the blood and pulses. Uh, just, just the characteristics of this video here, uh, and not just this one. This is one, of course. Uh, we have about 60 such videos from about 60 such experiments on 60 different angles. And uh, my collaborators and I are not the only people to see characteristics like this. Here's one tracer particle moving through a perivascular space, uh, also in a mouse, pulsing in the same direction as the blood, uh, broadly similar. Uh, I should say, these authors draw different conclusions later. I, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but their data does support this description. All right, so back to the comet tails. Uh, I'm coming from fluid dynamics. My training is in engineering. And uh, was really excited the first time I saw data like this because for many years I've been using automated particle tracking to measure flux. So we have an in-house code. It finds all the bright green dots, and then it connects each one from frame to frame to frame in an automated way such that we get a position and velocity measurement from each particle in each frame of the video. For this video, that gave us about 1.2 million measurements of 44,000 particles over 25 minutes. Um, and, and there's more. Uh, most of what, uh, I'll show you a few videos. So with data like that, it's a lot of fun because we can ask lots of questions. And for starters, I can ask about, uh, what's the mean flow? On average, what's this fluid? So we took uh, a long time series and average over time. At left, I'm showing you the velocity, uh, direction, and magnitude, direction, and length of these green arrows. At right, I'm showing you the speed, so it's redundant, but maybe easier to see. It's in color. Uh, we got speeds in this experiment up to 20 microns a second, or a little more. You can see they vary a bit from place to place. Uh, in particular, you can see that the speeds are high where another blood vessel is passing above or below. And that makes sense because uh, those are the places where there's less room for the perivascular space. Uh, it has to narrow there. And if you try to push the same amount of fluid through a narrower space, it has to go faster because of conservation. So that makes sense. Uh, you can also see from this image that the flow is quite slow behind the artery bifurcation. And we find that clinically interesting because it's known that uh, plaques of uh, amyloid and such often build up in the bifurcations. Maybe the reason is that the flow is slow and can't sweep waste away as it should. We don't know, but maybe. Uh, these are statistically significant results. Here are data from eight such experiments. And we can also think about dimensionless parameters from these sorts of measurements. So the Reynolds number is a famous dimensionless parameter in fluid dynamics, which tells you many things. Maybe most importantly, how likely is it that your flow is turbulent? Big Reynolds number, likely to be turbulent. Here the Reynolds number is 10 to minus 3, so it's quite small. Uh, we do not expect any turbulence in these flows. We do not expect any instabilities that are purely fluid dynamical. Uh, we expect laminar flow, though, of course, pulse. You can also think about the Peclet number, which is the ratio of the importance in mass transport of diffusion to infection. And here, for amyloid beta, the Peclet number is about 100. So in this part of the brain, amyloid beta is moving 100 times as much via advection as it is via diffusion. Uh, might be different in other parts, but that's what's going on. All right, uh, back to the data. There's more data I haven't showed you yet. 
simultaneous with this video that you, video that you have seen, we were recording vital signs. ECG in yellow, respiration in cyan, and now at the top I'm showing you what I'm calling VRMS, it's the instantaneous root mean square velocity. We calculate it this way, square all the speeds of all the particles in each frame, average them, and take a square root. It gives you a one number measure of how fast is the flow right now. And uh, you can see that it fluctuates, which makes sense because you can see fluctuation of the green dots in the movie. You can also see that it fluctuates in synchrony with the heart. For each peak in the ECG, there's a peak. And it's not in synchrony with the respiration. I think this is interesting. We've heard a lot about respiration this morning. Uh, and I do not claim that this means respiration never matters anywhere. I think it's a really interesting question to think about uh, which drivers matter in which parts of the sort of response to the flow. OK, so looks like it's synced with the heart. Uh, we can quantify that. And we can do it by taking time series of these signals, identifying each peak in the speed, and measuring the delay since the last heartbeat, measuring the delay since the last breath. Over many minutes of data, this leads to many thousands of cycles. And so we can make uh, histograms of those delays. Here's what the histograms look like, and this is actually eight different experiments on eight different animals in the standard deviation of histogram. What you can see is that over a wide range of delay times, we don't see a strong peak in respiration. We don't see a strong peak anywhere. It's almost uniform over a wide range of delay times. We do see quite a strong peak in the delay since the heart. So it's really simple. Now, OK. If this is synced with the heartbeat, what drives it? Why is it synced with the heart? Because after all, the artery connects to the heart, but the perivascular spaces do not. And one hypothesis that is not mine originally and goes back uh, more than a decade is that the pulsation of the adjacent artery walls might drive this flow. That would give you synchrony for sure. Uh, thinking about that, we measured the artery wall motion. Here it is. And we studied many cycles of this, uh, averaging over each cardiac cycle. So that I can plot you, uh, let's see, this is size, but I'm going to take a numerical derivative and plot the speed of the artery wall expanding or contracting as it varies over a cardiac cycle, typically, averaged over thousands. Heartbeat's at zero, the next heartbeat is at one, and actually this is five different experiments. Here's what it looks like. You get a fast expansion and slow constriction. All right? We can also average the instantaneous fluid speed over cardiac cycles, and here's what it is. Not only is the flow synchronized, but the speeds are quite similar in magnitude and in the shape of their variation over the cardiac cycle. So this is still circumstantial evidence, but maybe it's a bit more circumstantial evidence that perhaps this wall motion is driving the flow. Now, to go beyond circumstantial, you would need to manipulate the wall motion and find out if the flow changes accordingly. And so we set out to do that. And the way we set out to do it is by changing the blood pressure. So raising the blood pressure uh, causes the arteries to flex harder because they want to maintain their volume. They don't want to swell. Therefore, they have to stiffen against the pressure. And when the tissue is stiffer, waves, mechanical waves, propagate differently. So we set out to test that hypothesis, that maybe we could raise the blood pressure, maybe we could change the waves on the walls, and maybe that would change the CSF. Uh, we used angiotensin II, uh, a drug 
to raise the blood pressure. It raises blood pressure by 30, 40% in about 90 seconds. And we, okay, so yes, the blood pressure comes up. The next thing to check is, does the wall motion change? Here's that measurement. I'm showing you the change in artery width divided by the original width for normal blood pressure in yellow and high blood pressure in the cyan for the same animal before and after angiotensin II measuring in three different locations. And yes, you can see, and this is again averaged over a typical cardiac cycle, there's thousands of them into it, uh, you can see that the wall motion does change. So we successfully altered the wall motion. And uh, incidentally, this is with, I can again take numerical derivatives and look at speed. And remember before, fast expansion, slow contraction. With high blood pressure, and especially at the smaller, less muscular uh, places in these arteries, you get fast expansion and then you get fast contraction before slow contraction. So it's a bit of a qualitatively different uh, motion. And I want you to remember that for a little bit. Okay, so we raise the blood pressure, we change the wall motion, what happens? Here's the result. At left is the same video I've been showing you. At right is the same animal, same experiment, 10 minutes later after we gave angiotensin. And uh, you can see qualitatively things are different. Uh, you can see that the heart rate came up. We knew it would, that's a side effect. Uh, you can also see that it takes longer for one of these tracer particles to traverse the field of view in the high blood pressure case than in the normal blood pressure case. That is, manipulating the artery wall reduces the mean. And we can quantify that by averaging again over time. Here are uh, the two plots, mean flow with normal blood pressure, mean flow with high blood pressure, uh, you can see it's slow. And that's one experiment that I'm showing you now, but this is statistically insignificant. There are four experiments made controls. We, this slide's a little old, we have more. So, our best guess is that it is this motion of artery walls which drives this. Uh, and one side note, we change the artery wall motion by inducing high blood pressure. It's known clinically that early onset high blood pressure is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Maybe this is the mechanism. Maybe it's because that stiffens walls and makes the pumping not work as well, and therefore makes walls. Uh, that's speculation far out. A mouse is not a human, and uh, chronic blood pressure from a drug is not, uh, sorry, acute from a drug is not chronic, but it would be interesting to check out because there is a potential mechanism. Um, let's see. Here's the movie again. I want to mention one more thing, which is. Uh, you can see, I think I showed you that the mean flow goes down, but how is that? And I'm going to connect back now to those negative peaks on the wall speed. If you look closely at this movie, everything just looks jerkier. Particles in, with normal blood pressure pulse and then they speed up and slow down. Particles with high blood pressure uh, really jerk around a lot. In fact, they sometimes move back. And we can quantify that. So to do so, we have to first decide which way is forward and which way is back. Here's the mean flow. That's forward. Uh, we make unit vectors by dividing all those arrows by their length. And then we can calculate dot products, which uh, of, of any instantaneous velocity measurement with these green arrows, in order to extract the downstream component of the flow. So positive numbers mean it's moving forward, negative numbers mean it's moving back. And if we do this for uh, all our measurements and average over many, many cardiac cycles, we find that with normal blood pressure, as you can see in the movie, the speed fluctuates from faster to slower. 
With high blood pressure, as you can see in the movie, the speed fluctuates from forward to back. Uh, and that to me makes sense because with normal blood pressure, you've got fast expansion and slow contraction. With high blood pressure, you've got fast expansion, fast contraction, and then slow contraction. It's not true that every particle goes backwards. We have histograms. We can go into more details than just the means. But um, on average, they do. It's much more often. And maybe the final thing I'll mention is uh, there's been a lot of estimates in the literature about the sizes of perivascular spaces and flow in perivascular spaces. And Uh, and, and they often very different, and we kind of wondered how could that be. And what we found is that the fixation process causes these spaces to collapse. Uh, so if you look at literature and you strictly look for in vivo measurements, you'll see there's at least three different teams that have measured similar sizes uh, and published it. But if you go to fixed tissue, uh, it's much harder to know what the size was because when we fix via the usual procedure, this is where we get these open spaces collapsing. And I think that starts to explain um, or allow us to uh, yeah, explain it to you. So to close, I want to thank the uh, funding agencies that support my team's research, especially the National Institutes of Health and the Army, which are supporting this research in particular. And I want to thank my research team. They make it fun to go to work every day. Uh, this work is published in Nature Communications. It came out last November. And Finally, I want to mention there are multiple postdoc positions available at the University of Rochester to work on this. If you're interested or know strong candidates, I would love to talk to you. Thanks for your time. So if you just do Poisson flow in a 40 micron space with 20 microns per second, what do you get? Oh, I don't have the number off the top of my head. It's reasonable. We also just published a paper that I didn't talk about today about the hydraulic resistance of these spaces. And uh, they have this funny elongated shape, which turns out to appear to be biologically optimized. Um, it's in there. It's, it's reasonable. It's reasonable. I don't remember what it is. I think it's. Yeah, I'll stop. <laughs> All right. So, on the topic of um, whether it's arterial wall pulsation driving flow, yeah. um, it's very hard to create a net flow if you have a, an arterial wall moving at the wave speeds, the blood flow, right? Um, at least the modeling. Um, so, I, I'm just thinking could it be that this. This is a correlation effect. Uh, you're increasing your blood pressure. Um, could it be that it's really the IC, I guess the ICP, the intracranial pressure, is also affected by it? It's, it's what's uh, yeah, so it's right, generated we're by the blood pressure. Yeah? And uh, if you had some other pressure variation synced with the heart, that would give you a lot of this. Um, when we change the wall motion, it changes the flow, and the wall motion not only is synchronized, but has the same shape as the flow. Uh, we're so going to keep the looking at it. So, so just the ICP, right? I don't know if the ICP has that shape. Does anybody? Yeah, it does. OK, so that's interesting. Um, we are working on numerical simulations. You know, we'd like to be able to reproduce this in models and build confidence that way as well. Almost the same question, uh, but 
when you talk about ball motion, it's it's distension, right? Or and contraction. And and uh, being the pipe who make and hit. How does that in uh, uh, translate into a forward movement or pressure? Ah, uh, so it's so you have to yeah you have to have something to break the symmetry, right? Uh, one end of the pipe has to be different than another, or one end of the paradoxical space, and. Uh, the propagation direction of the wave on the artery wall is one such mechanism that breaks the symmetry, right? The, the waves on the wall propagate away from the heart, not toward. And that's consistent with this flow being parallel to blood, not being separate. So if the thought is some kind of peristaltic function that pushes the flow, okay. That's the thought. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then Montes. In terms of that peristaltic motion, I think many people have shown that from a wavelength point of view, that doesn't make sense, that you would have the peristaltic motion. And if you were to just model the segment, what you would have is the large CSF pool in the subarachnoid space, which fluctuates in pressure over time. So my thinking in this part would also be that's another factor rather than the local vascular pulsation that would cause the fluid motion. So you... The wavelength is much larger than the field of view here, so the slope is small. The wave is very fast, however, and those two effects offset. You know? I mean, you would have to, to model it and then see, and people have done that. They've come to the conclusion, us included, that the, the math does not add up. So have you also done that, or have you come up with a We're building different models. I've seen many papers that presumed that the slope of the wave was negligible because it's small. And I probably would have made the same presumption myself, but given this data and lacking any better explanation, I challenge that presumption. Well, I can tell you that we modeled both, and we, we've shown that the wavelength, you can model it as a propagating wave, or you model it as a parallel wall. Uh, with, the, with the realistic wavelengths, you don't get any and maybe to... What's your weight? But what are your speeds? And was your computational domain as long as a wavelength? No, because none of the neurovascular spaces are as long as a wavelength. The wavelengths are the of meters. Right, right. But I think... <sighs> okay, we should talk. Yeah. And also, I'm sorry, can I, can I follow up? Yeah. Sorry, quickly. So just from a purely engineering uh, point of view. So you mentioned you were looking only at inflow. So you're not looking at outflow at the moment, not yet. right? And then you said it's removal of amyloid beta. So if you look at removal, but you're pushing quote amyloid beta back inside the system, from an engineering point of view, that does not seem to make much well, sense. Well, there's lots of evidence that fluid passes through. There's lots of evidence that fluid passes through. And um, you know, starting with conservation of mass, this, this fluid is traveling 20 microns a second and it has to go somewhere. No, clearly. Just because what you were saying about if you were an engineer, you would construct a system where in the large vessels you would have convective flow and then yes. diffusive, but you probably wouldn't design it in a way to where you would push the garbage first inside the place from which you want to remove it. Oh, well, I don't think the sources of amyloid beta are at the outer edges of the perivascular spaces. I think they're mostly deep down where brain tissue is doing metabolism. Right, but so your flow is going there. Well, yeah, so you have to get fluid in in order to get fluid back out. I was just going to talk about the wavelength issue as well. Yep, yep. But just to add that the, the structure of the perivascular space is not just a, a uniform empty space. We've demonstrated that it's actually got a lot of collagen bundles in it, uh, and it tapers uh, significantly as, as you get into smaller vessels. And we've just published recently the relationship with the central canal that would be interesting compared with the relationship with the dependent line of the ventricle. So yeah, I'd like to talk is, more. Uh, it may be that structure of the perivascular space that is the, the thing here that makes the flow going on. I'd like to talk more and, and talk more about how the space varies from place to place. But here, you've seen these collapse. Um, so that suggests that they're largely open. I don't have data in my talk yet, but we've been doing studies of things like measuring the tortuosity of the paths of these particles and um, uh, measuring the uh, 
uh, distance they travel, displacement versus the square root of time, which you expect to have a different power law for advection and diffusion. Everything looks like dead on advection in these spaces. So that's, and the Peckley number says it should be. So we don't see evidence that this is porous media, not here. Um, where the arteries descend, I bet it is. So I'd like to talk about it. All right, so green. Can you help us understand, so the space you're looking at, excuse me, near the middle cerebral artery, yes. is that the surface of the brain, or you know, right. precisely where is it? Surface arteries, we've looked uh, right around the MCA in its first bifurcation, we've looked uh, two or three bifurcations, generations, uh, more distal as well. Uh, we consistently see this sort of behavior. Uh, particles do not pass into the penetrating articles, even though the fluid seems to, they don't spill out, which is why I think it might be. So uh, these are not actually very vascular spaces. They're not on the surface of the brain. They're, the surface. they're not very vascular spaces. I defer to others on the names of anatomy, but I'm interested in knowing where this fluid flows to. Yeah, it's not a very vascular space. You can see the bifurcation. So I, I, I honestly, if, you give, if these are the surface vessels, you should stop saying they're vascular spaces. So, they are bounded on the inside by artery walls, and they're bounded on the outside by uh, astrocytic end feet. Maybe, that's, I'm sure what I said is true. Maybe astrocytic surface end, means something different. No, astrocytic end feet around the pillar. There's the glia limitans on the surface, but there are really nice electromicroscopy studies to show the structure is arachnoid over these vessels. Well, I'm interested in where this book goes and what it does. All right, thanks. I think it's a really useful and interesting discussion. Sorry.